the film um, as personal as possible. Why did you choose to focus on, on this period? Um, and also, why did you choose to start the film with, um, you know, Samaran in a way already, already Samaran? I mean, the film actually dispenses with the whole biopic tradition of showing how somebody got to um, become who they are. Um, the first thing I, I, I was uh, thinking about is what is going to be my point of view. Um, Problems sometimes in biopics is they don't have point of view because it's only Evans, Evans, Evans. So I, I didn't want to show how um, Saint Laurent became Saint Laurent, but I was much more interested um, to show what it costs Saint Laurent to be Saint Laurent um, every day. So I, I decided to, to, to start with Saint Laurent already um, star, already uh, famous, and um, I can't treat his whole life. It's it's too long, and if you want to if you want to treat everything, you don't treat nothing, you know, because uh, you, you go too fast. So the, the ten years I chose, uh, 67, 76, are for me the most um, uh, crazy, the richest, and I think you have everything um, within these ten years. Uh, in 67, you still have a kind of young Saint Laurent. And in 76, um, even if, if he's only 40, uh, you already guess what is going to be later. You know? And in terms of fashion, uh, also I think you have everything uh, you can dream about uh, Saint Laurent style. Um, all his creations, his inventions. You know? and, uh, and I think the last reason is uh, I was very uh, interested in this period, especially in Paris and France. It's a very fascinating and crazy period. Your previous film, which you mentioned, uh, La Colonie, really serious House of Pleasures, was the film that was oh, set on, I guess, the cusp of an era, you know, the, the turn of the 19th century. Um, do you see this also as a film about the end of an era? Um, yeah, I think there is there are, there are very many uh, links between the two pictures, and this is one of them. Um, I'm always very moved by uh, an, uh, a, a world that ends. So in House of Pleasures, it was the 19th century in the beginning of the 20s, which is a huge, you know, uh, uh, revolution. And in Saint Laurent, it's uh, the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, which is a revolution also. And um, um, how do you think that? The passage from craft to industry. Um, which is something very um, uh, important for me to show. Um, I, uh, I, I want to ask you, I guess, two casting questions. Uh, could you say a little bit about uh, Gaspar Ulliel as Saint Laurent and uh, also, of course, Helmut Berger as the old Saint Laurent? Um, I'm going to start by uh, Helmut because uh, the end came first. Um, when uh, with uh, Thomas Pétain, the co-writer, we were um, starting to write the script. Um, we were writing the uh, we were writing the treatment you know, on one page. So uh, first act, second act, third act, you know. and third act uh, we wrote. Okay, 1989. We go on a flash forward, and I, one of the important <coughs> items is to, to show that uh, Saint Laurent uh, was somewhere else, you know. Even his, his body is not the same, he is someone else. And we took it literally, someone else, we're going to change actors. Uh, I didn't want to use the makeup on Gaspar, it's something I don't really like. I always see on the screen, you know, the work of the makeup artist and not the actor anymore. So I really like this change of body, you know. And the image we had um, very quickly in our mind is Henry Berger. It's, it's flash, you know, uh, because I think in the 70s, I had these uh, um, souvenirs of uh, mm -hmm. pictures of Helmut and pictures of Eve, uh, quite similar, and Helmut, as much as Eve um, had a lot of drugs and alcohol, and his body became really heavy, and there's something very moving uh, in showing that. So it's, you can say it's a, a, a screenplay idea, more like a testing idea, the, the change of actor. As for Gaspar, um, of course, it's it's the main uh, uh, the main point. Uh, when I was 
saying around me, I, I'm, I'm preparing the field of Saint Laurent. Um, everyone uh, told me, Gaspar Rudiel, Gaspar Rudiel, Gaspar Rudiel, and because it's true, there is a very strong resemblance. But I don't want to, 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 to stop on that, you know, it's not enough for me. So I met Gaspar, but I met like 20 other actors, we made some tests, long tests, uh, and what I loved about Gaspar is that, uh, you know, I think I, you, you, I'm not uh, filming Yves Saint Laurent, I'm filming, of course, the actor, you know, I'm filming Gaspar. As well, I'm not feeling Pierre Berger, but Jeremy Agnier. So you have to fall in love with the real actor, not only with you know, the uh, character he's doing. And um, Gaspar and I had the same idea that uh, the person we wanted to, the character wanted to create, had to be like 50% of Saint Laurent and 50% of Gaspar. I wanted something of him, you know. So it's not only an imitation, but it's something more incarnated. To, to come back to Helmut Berger, I'm wondering if um, it was in any way because Visconti was someone you had in mind while thinking about this film or thinking about the figure of, of Saint Laurent? But I think uh, Yves Saint Laurent is uh, a Visconti character. You know? There are a lot of bridges between the two. Um, they both share uh, the love of beauty. Um, they both share the love of Proust. You know? uh, it's, uh, um, they both share uh, many, many things. Uh, so, through Saint Laurent, uh, yes, I, I guess I thought uh, about this quite a lot. So, of the um, <clears throat> of the, the two Saint Laurent films that have come out, um, this is the one that was made without um, the participation of, of Pierre Roger and the Foundation. Could you talk a bit about what that meant for you in terms of um, recreating, uh, you know, just the, 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 the labor that went into not having access, certain access that might have helped? Um, yeah, it's true we didn't have access to any uh, archives or any uh, dresses. But uh, now uh, the real Yves Saint Laurent dresses, there are museum pieces, you know, so it's very difficult to, 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 to manipulate them anyway. So it wasn't too much a problem that we didn't have access to them. Uh, so we had to recreate an, um, an atelier. Sewing workshop. Um, <laughs> truly a sewing workshop in the style of Saint Laurent. And we had like uh, a 20 uh, seamstresses. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and then they made uh, exactly as it used to be made uh, the two collections that you saw in front. But for me, the advantage, it, it makes the, uh, the clothes very living. You know? It's not uh, something uh, that comes from the museum, it's the real life. Uh, can you talk a bit about the, the structure of the film and also the, the sense of time in the film? Um, which, uh, again, another connection to, I think, House of Pleasures, um, which is just a very fluid sense of time. The film proceeds more or less chronologically, um, but then this time becomes much more fluid and slippery in the last hour of the film. Yeah, um, the first two uh, parts of the film are quite chronologic, and then I wanted that the third part, uh, at the moment uh, when Helmut arrives, uh, we, we, we um, approach him so much that we're almost in his head. And um, I wanted the idea of the time to explode, you know? Like if you, if you come into a room and there are mirrors everywhere, and each mirror you know, is a part of yourself. Uh, the film at that moment uh, becomes quite mental and much more effective than in the beginning. I, I wanted the film to have a kind of arc, so I used um, the, the, the time for that. Uh, I guess just one last question for me before I open it up. I'd, I'd like you to talk a bit about, um, about music. Uh, I guess it always plays a very important part in, in your films. You're a musician as well and composed the score. Uh, so the music on several levels, the score of the film which you compose, but also the use of, um, of opera and classical and also of contemporary uh, pop music. Um, it's true that I'm very close from music because I'm a musician and much before I was a movie maker. And uh, it's important to me uh, that uh, when you start writing a scene or a film, I want to have in mind the sound of the film, not only you know, the images or the dialogues, but the sound. The sound is 
not really music, it's really the, uh, the whole sound. And I decided very uh, early to, for this film that it would be basically split into uh, two kinds of music. Um, soul music from the 70s and uh, opera. Uh, and also that all the music um, would uh, come from inside the scenes. You know, not, not much score, but inside the scenes. Which I like on, on that. Uh, what I like on that is that the, uh, the spectator and the characters are on the same level uh, of emotion um, to the music. And then I realized uh, during the editing that uh, these two kind of music were not enough. And I, I added some music and composed more electronic um, in, you know, in uh, the way of these, these years, like 74, 75. So, you know, it's like uh, it was really more uh, equilibrated. All right, we'll take some questions. I think there are mics handed out. It's a hard film to watch, and a very good one, but it's hard to see this life. My question has to do with, essentially, what do you think the relationship between Pierre and Yves Saint Laurent was, and what was the significance of the liberation newsroom's warmth towards him? Um, it's a hard film to watch, you said. Uh, yeah, I agree, because it's a film also about a very uh, depressed man, a very melancholic man. Um, uh, the relationship between Pierre and Yves, uh, when, when I start the movie, it's in 67, and Pierre and Yves, uh, met in 58, I guess. So when the film starts, uh, they're together for eight years and uh, the, uh, um, the house by itself is created for five years. Um, so it's not my main you know, uh, subject, but I, I can try to answer. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's 50 years of, uh, of life together um, with beautiful moments and terrible moments. I think um, some people that knew them very well that I met, uh, they, they told me uh, they're like a, a monsters with two heads. And I, I like this image because uh, I think it's quite right, you know, it's not the, uh, the tough uh, money guy and the you know, fragile uh, uh, creator, it's just, it's more complicated than that. And they really found each other to, to create something very uh, strong, you know. And what's the last question? The, the significance of the Liberation newsroom and the warmth that the newsroom had towards him. I tried to uh, to take away from the film uh, all the sentences, you know, that are sometimes in biopics, uh, like uh, um, Eve uh, changes the woman, all this kind of stuff that I found a little heavy. But at the same time, I thought they were important, you know, uh, that uh, uh, they should be said at one moment. So I used. Uh, the exercise of an, uh, necrology, necrology? Uh, an obituary. Ah. Uh, to put all this, you know, it's it's something that um, uh, intrigues me. You know, you're you're a journalist. You you, you hear at four o'clock that someone important dies, and you have to give your paper at six. You have two hours to resume his life. You know, so that's basically the sense of this uh, sequence. things. Uh, first, could you talk about your research? Uh, and the second thing about the dog, that scene was very powerful, the dog dying. I'd love to know how you did that. Okay, start by the second. The dog is very fine now. He's <laughs> living in the countryside. He's very, very happy. <laughs> and, uh, we had a very good doctor. And, uh, uh, now, for the dog, it's true that um, Eve had uh, this kind of dog. Then when the dog died, he took another, the same, and called him Mujik 2, and then Mujik 3, and Mujik 4. It's something that, uh, it says something about his craziness, you know, his obsession. 
So, of course, I, from this uh, real element, I have to create something because the film is, is full of invention, it's not only, you know, uh, and I like the idea of the dog eating pills because it's, at the same time, so quite funny and totally pathetic. Yeah. About the research, I've made a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. Uh, but for me, the point of doing research is the best thing to get rid of it, you know, to, to, to take some freedom, you know. Uh, it's, I prefer to take freedom uh, when I know where the reality is, um, so that's why I, I make so much, so much research. There's a long scene um, that doesn't have Yves Saint Laurent in it, and that is the business meeting, where um, I think I've never seen anything like it, or actually heard anything like it, how you were using language, the two languages and the interpreter, overlapping. It becomes something else than the content. And we look at the, we look at the patterns of the ties, and we have this. Is, could you talk about this fascinating scene? Yes, yeah, sure. It's, it was a very important scene for me. Um, uh, on the first draft of the script, there were many informations about the economy, you know, and at one moment I said, this is too much informative, let's try to make a huge one moment, one huge moment, you know. And it, Eve is not in there, but at the same time he talks about Eve. And the idea of the sequence was to try to, 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 to um, uh, there is a, quite a, um, an easy, um, uh, Stakes, and easy stakes, but I wanted the spectator to look at some people, you know, you don't always understand what they say, but you say, I don't understand, but they do understand what they're doing, you know, some, something very technical. Uh, and I, I wanted to do the scene which is only talking, uh, like an action movie, you know. Um, and of course the interpreter, uh, which is quite, now people, Basically, everyone you know, talks good English, but in the 70s, someone like Pierre Vachelis, he don't speak English. <coughs> so I like the idea to have the interpreter because it gives some tension on the scene. You know? Even if you lose the sense, you have a, a, a general feeling of something quite tense. And uh, I, it took me like nine years, uh, nine years, nine days to, to, to write the scene. It was very, very long and very precise. Even me now, I'm not sure I understand what's ha what happening, you know? but I know it's right. And, oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say this was an incredible film. There were so many different moments that spoke to so many different emotions, and on the whole, it's just overwhelming in the best possible way. But I wanted to ask you about a very specific scene, and to me, it feels like the heart of the entire film. Um, and it's, it's, I think it is the last time that we see Eve working one-on-one -on -one with a customer, patron, friend, whatever, when the woman is trying on the suit and she's worried that it looks too masculine. And there's just this brief, you know, it's two minutes or so of him working with his, like, two highest, most important assistants, you know, finding how this woman fits into this dress. And it's an absolutely electrifying sequence. And I was just sort of, uh, is that based on, you know, any sort of record, or is that just something that you came up with to sort of harness the emotion of that experience for people? Um, thank you very much. Um, you know, there is this kind of, uh, uh, on books or on the Wikipedia or on everything, you always uh, hear, Eve changes the woman, you know, which is something quite theoretical. So I, I tried to do a scene that, uh, can, can, can I say to do? A scene that would embody this idea. And, um, I think one of my uh, favorite film of all time is uh, uh, Vertigo, and I wanted to do a kind of Vertigo in two minutes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, beside that, it's the, the, the actress uh, Valeria. She don't change anything about you know her costume from the beginning to the end of the scene. It's just the look of the genius on her, and. Little by little, she feels good because she's looked by him. You know, it's really the meaning of, of, of this scene, and it's this, as I told you, this uh, general idea that we always hear is if changes the woman. I, I, I make this uh, simple call for that. We have time for a couple more questions. I see hands.
Hold on, wait for the microphone. Um, you're very open with the homosexuality in Eve's life. Um, their orgies, their kisses, its exchanges of pills. Did you wonder how much you were going to show or how much of the orgies you were going to show? And could you have made this film 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier with the same openness? Paradoxically, the film is very chaste. Um, because you don't see anything, you know, really. It's uh, uh, a, 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 a lot is off screen. Um, but I was very interested in the atmosphere, much more than in uh, six things uh, that they are not you know, in, in the film. Um, about homosexuality, uh, actually, I didn't uh, think a lot about it because I don't think it's a subject for Yves or Pierre. Uh, what I mean by that, it, it would be a subject if it was like um, homosexuality versus uh, heterosexuality or the discovery of, you know, this would be a subject, but not in this film, not with them. I, I, I wrote the scenes uh, exactly like if uh, they were for uh, um, two women or a man and a woman. The, the thing I was really, um, uh, I worked on a lot was the, uh, the period. Mm -hmm. uh, the atmosphere of the period. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's in the 70s, so it's uh, uh, before the AIDS and before the crisis, and you know, it's uh, a very much more. Uh, um, there was much more lightness and freedom. And uh, that's what I tried to show uh, with uh, these sequences. We have time for one last question. And... All right, Jim. Hold on, hold on a second. Come on. It's a simple question. Has Carl seen the film, and does he have any feedback? And the larger question is, what actually is Jacques' role in this film? Um, Carl, uh, he, uh, he sends message every uh, two weeks. Uh, he wants to see the film. He wanted to come to Cannes, and it be canceled. Then he wanted to do a private screening, and it canceled. Then he wanted to come at the avant Première in Paris, and it canceled. Carl is too busy. You know, he's uh, 83 and he's working night and day. I don't know how he makes it, but uh, he's too busy. But he's very curious. He's very curious because Jack uh, uh, has really been the big love of his life. So he was, I guess, anxious of how I was showing him. Um, for me, Jack de Bacher is a, a kind of character that don't exist anymore uh, these days. That's what I really liked. He's like... Uh, uh, He's like a, a black star. <laughs> and someone that has no past and no future, only present time. And uh, I liked uh, this idea and this character, that's why I, I, I focused a lot uh, on him in the film. But beside that, uh, I think on the script it was a little smaller. But when we were shooting, I thought all the sequences between Rigarel and Gaspar were so... Um, Beautiful. Something really happened between the two actors, you know, a very great, a lot of grace. So I extended to the scene because, uh, you know, a, a director is a vampire, you know, you see something good. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you all for coming and for thank you very much.